So why is stone so important to hunter-gatherers of the world? Stone tools are used by hunter-gatherers for a variety of daily tasks. Plants provide vitamins and minerals crucial to human survival. Stone knives are used to cut plants. Stone is used to grind plants into pieces and pastes. Animals provide meat and fat important in hunter-gatherer diets. Stone projectile points are used for hunting animals. Flaked stone knives are used for butchering animals. Flaked scraping tools are used for preparation of leather and hides for clothing and shelter. The evolutionary history of stone tools uh, basically implies that all of our ancestors used stone tools, except for the more recent ones of the last couple hundred years or couple thousand years, depending on what part of the world you come from. But no matter what part of the world you come from, without fail, we all have successful hunter-gatherer ancestors that made and used stone tools every day. That started three million years ago. Uh, our human ancestors, the Australopithecines, started to walk upright and they used very crude non-lithic tools. Homo habilis was known as handyman starting two million years ago in Africa and they made the first stone tools. About a million years ago, Homo erectus evolved and they were the first to make complex stone tools such as bifaces. They also were the first Homo species to move out of Africa. About 200,000 years ago, Modern humans, Homo sapiens, evolved, replacing Homo erectus. 100,000 years ago, complex stone tools evolved by humans in Africa, Europe, and Asia. And by 40,000 years ago, people had used those stone tools and other technology to move into places uh, much more remote, like Siberia and Australia. 15,000 years ago, humans migrated to America and just the other day, it, we learned that it might even be as early as 20 or 23,000 years ago. 11,000 years ago, Clovis points were created. They are perhaps the finest stone tools ever produced. And we've talked about Clovis being the first evidence of people living in Yellowstone. So that's just an approximate timeline of the evolutionary history of humans and their use of stone tools. In terms of the migration of humans from Africa to, to North and South America, this uh, illustration, this map, gives you a little bit of an idea about what we just talked about, moving out of Africa 100 to 200,000 years ago, moving into Europe and Asia after 100,000 or so years ago, uh, moving into Siberia, Australia 40 to 50,000 years ago, eventually making their way into North and South America by 20 to 15,000 years ago or so. The last place to be colonized on Earth was Polynesia. And that came after 2,500 years ago. Today, we're more or less successful than our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Um, there's a lot of authors out there that might say that uh, we're less successful given the longevity of hunter-gatherer life. Hunter-gatherers lived on Earth for, for 3 million years. Uh, how long will the industrial technological complex survive? Is, is our current way of life using that industrial technological complex sustainable? Just interesting to think about. I'm not sure I know the answer, but it is, like I said, just interesting to think about because I think it's it's kind of assumed that our modern way of life is somehow better or, or more successful, but we've only been doing this for a little while compared to the longevity of hunter-gatherers on Earth. So in Yellowstone and all across the world, hunter-gatherers used various types of stone in order to survive. Stone tools can be produced from most rocks with a high silica or glass content, mostly organized into three general types of rocks, igneous or volcanic rocks, the types that we've seen in Yellowstone very commonly. So obsidian, dacite, and basalt can all be found in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We've talked mostly about obsidian, but dacite is also commonly found. There's a big dacite quarry over by Ennis, Montana. It's a type of volcanic rock. The other general type of rock is sedimentary rocks. We have a lot of those in Yellowstone. Chert and petrified wood and chalcedony, orthoquartzite and quartzite all can be found in quite a bit of abundance in Yellowstone proper and in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and the Rocky Mountains in general. Finally, there's metamorphic rocks. The best example that I've talked about in our Yellowstone class is soapstone, that very soft stone, also known as steatite, that can be found in the mountain ranges east of Yellowstone and can be carved into pottery-like vessels. 
So in terms of igneous or volcanic rocks, they are the key to stone tool production in Yellowstone. They are rocks that form from the magma or lava of a volcano. And yes, we all know that Yellowstone is a volcano. So the Latin word is ignis equals fire. Lava, lava is when magma or molten rock reaches a temperature of 1300 degrees Fahrenheit, reaches the Earth's surface. When that lava cools very quickly, it forms the volcanic rocks like basalt, dacite, and obsidian. It has a very high glass content. Magma is the liquid rock under the Earth's surface. Um, that typically forms rock like granite. So yes, granite is a volcanic rock. It's filled with metals and fragments of unmelted rock or crystals, so it's not good for stone tools, meaning it has a lot more impurities and it doesn't have nearly as much glass content as the rocks like basalt, dacite, and mostly obsidian. So Yellowstone definitely rocks. This is a figure from the Before Yellowstone book, and the red triangles on this chart show the obsidian sources in Yellowstone. This will be important for you to study for that test three coming up at the end of this section. So one of the things we can do in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is look at the locations of stone sources and track human movements over time through their use of the different stone sources. So for example, if we're working in the northern part of Yellowstone and we see different types of rock being used, we can say perhaps that this was used by the Salish, the Kootenai, the Blackfeet. For the northwest portion, maybe the Nez Perce or the Blackfeet or a band of the Shoshone in the northeast or eastern part of Yellowstone. Uh, the Crow were over in that area quite a lot. And you will see these different types of um, tribes like the Shoshone, the Bannock, the Mountain Shoshone, the Eastern Shoshone, uh, using lots of southern Yellowstone sources as they moved northward. So we see these distributed at the archaeological sites and it helps us understand territories. So volcanic rocks are used for stone tools in Yellowstone. Obsidian is an extrusive lava that is highly silicious or glassy and cools very rapidly. That high silica content creates glassy and sharp stone great for making stone tools. The process of making stone tools is called flint napping. And obsidian is the sharpest substance on earth. This fellow here shown is Don Crabtree. He actually had open heart surgery and made his surgical tools out of obsidian for the surgeon to use. Dacite is another type of volcanic rock that's an extrusive lava that has reduced silica and content compared to obsidian, but still quite a bit compared to other materials like granite. Um, this results in a dacite that's a coarser rock with more inclusions and impurities. It's not as good for stone tools, but is still a high quality material to make stone tools. So uh, for example, around Ennis, Montana, there's a lot of dacite and Native Americans used it quite a lot. Sedimentary rocks can be used for stone tools in Yellowstone as well. Uh, chert is an opaque rock comprised of a high content of silica. Chalcedony is typically a type of chert that has transparency or translucency. Orthoquartzite is quartz sand structure, which is rich in silica. There's a lot of that in Yellowstone, and there's pictures of all these materials on the right there. Uh, and also, this is an illustration from the Before Yellowstone book. And there's a lot of petrified and silicified wood. That's a fossil basically forming when a plant material is buried and silica rich groundwater flows through and replaces that decayed wood and old wood with silica and other glassy materials, uh, making it petrified and sometimes a very glassy. And so in the upper left on the figure, this is a Pelican Lake projecto point produced during the later archaic time period. And you can see the grain of the wood in the rock. Metamorphic rocks are used for stone tools in Yellowstone as well. Steatite or soapstone is a talc schist rock, which is rich in magnesium. It holds heat well, it's soft and easily carved. It's used as stone vessels by the Shoshone tribe in the greater Yellowstone region, um, uh, similar to how pottery was used. So flint napping is the process of stone tool manufacture. All the world's hunter gatherers were flint nappers at some point in their lives. All of us have ancestors that were good flint nappers. Uh, today, archeologists become flint nappers to replicate the experiences of past peoples that produced stone tools. It's uh, something that I do for my research because I want to understand how to make a stone tool so I can interpret the stone tools that I find at archeological sites. 
So I've posted the video by Bruce Huckle for you to watch on Moodle. There's another Stone Tool production video that um, I've posted as well. I've also posted a, um, a, uh, another movie about Yellowstone stone materials, especially obsidian, for you to watch. But, so there's no movie quiz this week, but I will include a question or two or three about the movies on test three. So lithic analysis is the study of stone tools. Many archaeologists are lithic analysts, and I am, I am one as well. We try to understand the process of flint napping in the past, how and where stone was procured or collected, how stone tools were produced, how stone tools were used, and what were the circumstances in which stone tools were thrown away or discarded. It's called a stone tool life cycle, from procurement to production to use and discard. Lithic analysis research issues uh, come in an array of different topics. We study human settlement patterns or travel patterns. We study trade networks. We study the technology itself. We study different types of hunting and gathering that used stone tools and how they food processed. We study site use issues such as what kinds of activities were conducted, the population of a, of, a, of a human group at an archaeological site is based on the number of stone tools. We can also sometimes figure out how long people camped at a location based on the amounts of stone left at a site. So this is the map of Yellowstone Obsidian. I'm going to talk about two, three sources today. Uh, one is Cougar Creek Obsidian, uh, one is Crescent Hill, and one is Obsidian Cliff Obsidian. So Crescent Hill up in the north, Obsidian there. Um, there's two other materials I want to talk about. So Kruger Creek Obsidian, which is an obsidian formed by magma at about the same time as Obsidian Cliff. Obsidian Cliff will be the topic of the next lecture. And then Crescent Hill Chert, which is red, green, and purple chert formed in a rhyolite formation uh, along the Yellowstone River east of Mammoth. So the Kruger Creek Obsidian was originally collected and uh, in the 1980s, and it was only mapped by the University of Montana in 2017. Uh, it is just east of the town, West Yellowstone. What did we find at the quarry? Uh, there's thousands of obsidian flakes, natural and tested obsidian, cobbles used as hammer stones, pits and trenches, evidence of mining. Cougar Creek trenches and pits are shown in these photographs. Camps around the Cougar Creek quarry were, were abundant. Um, the Crescent Hill Church source is east of Mammoth. This is uh, mostly documented in a master's thesis published in 2010 out of the University of Montana by one of our students, Jacob Adams. This is a surface chert quarry with green, red, and purple chert and multiple outcrops on the plateau. In terms of Yellowstone lithics, uh, Native Americans preferred obsidian cliff among all varieties. Uh, other materials were used more locally, but obsidian cliff, as you know, was distributed quite wide, widely, not just around Yellowstone, but all across North America. And that's what the topic of our next lecture will be. Thank you.